Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to have with us today Rob A. Gentile. He is the author of a book called Forks of Light, A Near-Death Experience, What I Saw That Opened My Heart. And I think you will be very moved by his story and awestruck as well. Rob A. Gentile is the son of Italian immigrants. His father worked in a steel mill and he grew up in Apoliqua, Pennsylvania. He has spent his career as a sales engineer in the steel industry while married to his wife, Melania. He's been married to her for over 30 years. Today, they have devoted themselves to their special needs daughter, Maria, who is in her 20s and whom Rob refers to as a pure spirit. Throughout his childhood, he grappled with difficulties, questions about prayer, and why must children suffer? Answers came to him in a sudden and unexpected way. At age 56, he had a massive heart attack, then flatlined and had his near-death experience in NDE. Self-discovery and spiritual awakening continued while waiting to receive a donor heart. This is his first book. So I, with that, I welcome Rob A. Gentile. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have a very special guest with us. And as you heard in the intro, he experienced an NDE. He's also the author of a book called Quarks of Light, a near-death experience to what I saw that opened my heart. And I'm super excited to be able to speak with Rob today. He has a story to tell that ranges from miraculous to emotional. There are so many words that you can use to describe it. And he's here today to tell his story. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. I'm blessed and very honored to have you with us today. Thank you for the lovely intro, Carolyn. I appreciate it. So I, as I explained, I, I did a little intro kind of explaining to folks who you are, a little bit about your background. But if you can delve into that a little bit more, tell folks like why we're here today, what you experienced, and let's just go over real quickly what an NDE is for folks to, that don't really know. That, you know, that's a great question, Carol Ann, because a lot of people, they really don't. They've, you know, this NDE thing is starting to, to go around. So I'm the last person in the world that ever would have thought of having uh, an NDE, which is a near-death experience. So just a little bit about me. I was born and raised in a very small steel mill town in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. And my parents were Italian immigrants. They both immigrated from, from Italy. My grandfather went into the steel mill. My father went into the steel mill. I went into the steel mill, my three brothers. And that's where my, my life uh, had, had begun. So fast forward, I actually remained in the steel industry. I worked myself out of the steel mill and got into kind of like the sales engineer portion of, of selling steel, got hired by a company back then, and they transferred me all around the country. Now I, I live in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. But what happened to me was at age 56 years old, I, uh, and, and ironically, I had gone back to Pittsburgh for this operation. Um, when I was younger, I was involved in a lot of sports, martial arts, things like that. And I had these bone spurs on my neck that were that were pinching my nerves. And, you know, my wife's a pharmacist and she said, look, the last thing you want to do is have traditional surgery where they cut open the back of your neck and, and then they fuse your discs together and, and, and you have, you know, you're in pain the rest of your life. So there's a very famous Korean doctor in Pittsburgh that actually developed his own method of going in through the front of the neck. They cut you and they move the esophagus aside and they go in and they drill out these, these spurs, which are nothing but calcium deposits on your neck that are pinching your nerves. So very simple surgery. I was only in the hospital one night and they send you home. But what had happened to me was just a, a fluke. Four days later, back in North Carolina in my bed, um, what my doctors know now is I threw a blood clot. And that blood clot went right into my widow maker, which is uh, the left side of the heart, the LAD. And 
at the time, of course, who knew what was going on? So as you can imagine, it's about 11 p.m. at night. And I have one child, my daughter, Maria, she's special needs. Um, she can't walk, talk, feed herself. She has a seizure disorder. So at 11 o'clock at night, there are these horrible screams in the house. And uh, my wife jumps out of bed and you know runs down the hall and thinks it's Maria. And when she realizes it isn't, she comes back into our room and flips on the light. And there I am laying in bed, thrashing and screaming in pain. And I said to my wife, Melanie, I have never felt a pain like this in my life. And it was in my neck. And that's the last thing I said. I passed out from the pain. And my wife called 911. And thank God they got there very, very quickly. And I only live like three miles from the hospital. So she calls a neighbor to come in and watch Maria. And they're rushing me to the hospital. And the EMT knows I'm having a heart attack. He just doesn't know how bad it is. So they get me into the ER, they rush me into a room, and whatever medicines, they probably blood thinners, nitroglycerin, I don't know, they gave me something to stabilize me because now it's about 11.30, you know, 12 o'clock at night, and the cardiologist was not in the hospital. Cardiologist was on call. So it's my wife and the nurse in the room, and the nurse says to my wife, it looks like he's stable, so we're fine until the cardiologist gets there. And Carolyn, as soon as the nurse said that, my wife said it was like a scene from the movie, The Exorcist. It was almost as if someone had grabbed me by my shirt and just pulled me forward with great force on the gurney. I had been unconscious since we left the house. My eyes were closed and there I was, all of a sudden I I sprang forward on the gurney, my eyes popped wide open, and I screamed out the name Frosty. And I screamed out the name Frosty, and I collapsed backwards on the gurney, and boom, the monitor went flat. I flatlined, and in the hospital, when someone flatlines, which means you know their heart stops, uh, code blue you know rings out through the hospital, code blue, and in rushes a uh, a doctor with a team and they began to try to resuscitate me. So what was interesting about this is that um, the doctor tries to resuscitate me. She's working on me. Five minutes go by, she can't get my heart to start. So they continue to paddle shock me. She starts to do vigorous sternal rubs. I'm not coming back, 10 minutes go by. I'm still not coming back. My organs begin shutting down. 15 minutes go by. They take out the epinephrine, these long needles that they shove directly through the chest into the heart. I got four injections of epinephrine. I'm still not coming back. 20, more than 20 minutes, and all this is in my medical records for public consumption, more than 20 minutes go by. And finally, the cardiologist arrives. He does an emergency catheterization, cuts my thigh open, fishes a camera up there. He finds the blockage in my Widowmaker and puts in two stints and blood starts to flow. But by then I'm in cardiogenic shock and respiratory failure. So another doctor rushes in, they shove the tubes down my throat. I'm on the vent and they put me in another room and I would lay in a four day coma. So that's how my journey began. Wow, that that kind of leaves you breathless. Um, yeah, it, it it does. It's such a riveting story. Um, did they determine that the blood clot was from your neck surgery? Was it just that you had the uh, only because my nephew um, he was in Iraq and he had a shoulder surgery from mm. an injury and he threw a blood clot and passed away. Mm -hmm. so I'm yeah. just wondering if it was surgery induced or not. That's the assumption mm -hmm. that all of my doctors made that it was definitely surgery induced because, and I didn't know this, but you know, but any surgery is incredible stress to the body. And right. you go in there and you start cutting things open and mm -hmm. you just don't, you just don't know. So, but because I was always a healthy guy, you know, athletic and, and all of that, that's why, 
it was such a fluky thing that nobody in, in their in their mind would have ever imagined that age 56 I would have a massive heart attack and, and die you know so <clears throat> that's wow. how uh, that's how it all began and, and I have to tell you Carol Ann so my oldest brother I was raised Catholic and uh, my so my oldest brother drives down from Pittsburgh nine hour drive and as soon as he gets there he calls the local parish priest. The parish priest comes and anoints me with oil and ashes. In, in the Catholic faith, it's called extreme unction. You only get one of those in your life, you know, to to forgive your sins and, and get ready to face God. So I've got my last rites, and a couple of days go by, and, and they're sending neurologists in to see if I were brain dead. I don't know how they do that, but on the fourth day, the doctor came to my wife and my family and said, look, we, we can't, we can't wait any longer. We're going to pull these tubes out. He's probably a vegetable, but we'll see what we have, but we're going to see if he can breathe on his own. So obviously I did. <clears throat> um, that was a very, that was a very, very traumatic experience because as they started to take those tubes out, I became aware of what was going I didn't know that I had a heart attack and I'd been in a coma for four days. All right. I knew was that, that I was suffocating, you know, <laughs> And I'm, I'm screaming at the nurse that, hey, you know, suction me, I'm suffocating. But I was actually screaming in my own head because I couldn't talk, you know, so it was a kind of a crazy thing. But what's incredible about this is that when I'm, re I'm in recovery, my wife was the first one to come into the room. And she said that I was talking in this high pitched childlike voice. And I said to her, Melanie, you have to believe me. You have to believe me. It was frosty. It was frosty that came to me. And she said, oh my God, Rob, that makes so much sense. And I said, what are you talking about? That makes sense. I said, what do you, what do you mean? She said, right before you flatlined, you sprang forward on the gurney and you shouted out frosty's name, your eyes popped open. And that's when you flatlined. Mm. So to give you some background, um, frosty was my brother-in-law. He was the same age as me. And seven weeks before I passed away that night or almost passed away, my brother-in-law, Frosty, unfortunately had taken his own life. And they, Frosty was going through a, a bad divorce at the time and he had his own business. He was a landscaper. It was around the holidays and a lot of pressure. And, you know, he had one daughter in college, his only child, and, and Frosty did struggle with drugs at one time in his life, but he had been clean for like five years. But all the pressure, you know, had been building up on him. And he went out that night and he got a hold of a, a street drug that just drove him mad for like 45 minutes. And he was living in the upstairs um, room of his parents' house. And he came home that night and he unfortunately, you know, took his own life. So his mother had called me like 5.30 in the morning to come down and go up into that house. And I only live like 35 miles from um, my wife's parents' house. So, you know, Caroline, it was strange because I went up into that room seven times and picked through a rather gruesome scene. They wanted me to try to find a note or a journal or something as to why Frosty, you know, had, had done that. And on the seventh time upstairs, I did find a journal, uh, which I had I had given to the family. So, but back to my wife in in the, you know, in the hospital. And so when she's when I told her that it was Frosty, she said, you know, tell me, tell me exactly what Frosty said to you. And Frosty said to me, I made a big mess of things, and you have to go back and help clean things up, but tell my parents I'm in a good place. And she said, oh, my God, yes, that's exactly what my brother would have said. He was always making a mess of things. And, you know, for me, so this was the first spiritual kind of awakening that I had ever had in my life. And it was a huge paradigm shift in my belief system because being raised Catholic and I know they've changed the rules now, mm -hmm. but when I grew up, you know, taking one's life was considered a mortal sin. You were condemned to hell. There was no pass go. And so, you know, laying there in bed, you're thinking, I, I don't think that a loving God would ever condemn someone for such a complicated, 
you know, act, particularly someone who was under the influence of drugs or alcohol or mental problems or whatever it is. And oh, by the way, Frosty told me he was in a good place that I don't think, I don't think hell is, if there is one, right. is, a, is a good place. So that was my first big, you know, awakening paradigm shift um, in, in my beliefs, which was tremendously freeing to me. Yes. Um, and the second thing that happened, which was really beautiful, is uh, on, on the second day out of coming out of coma, I was laying in my bed and for the first few days, uh, my arms were completely paralyzed. I couldn't even scratch my nose. And this beautiful Indian woman um, comes into my room in, in her, you know, in her whites and, and she sits down beside me, pulls up a chair and she knew my arms were paralyzed and she put her hand on mine and she introduced herself and she said, Rob, I'm Dr. Patel and I am the doctor that wouldn't give up on you that night. And she started to get very emotional about how many times she lost me. And, you know, she should have called it like five minutes into, mm -hmm. you know, into, into my flat line, <clears throat> but she refused to give up on me. And what it was curious is that she got very personal all of a sudden, which I found was odd, you know, just laying there paralyzed and listening. She began to talk about her father. And she said, you know, uh, I'm Hindu and I've always had a very strong faith and spiritual life. And I was very close to my father. He helped me through medical school and we can almost read each other's minds. And she said, you know, all he lived for was to see my first child born. I was pregnant with my first child and he just could not wait to see my son's face. Mm -hmm. And six months before my son was born, he had an aneurysm and died suddenly. Oh. And she said, you know, I've been really bitter about that and I've lost my spirituality and I've been, you know, kind of closed off to that now. And But she said, you know, seeing you here alive, which you shouldn't be, gives me hope that maybe, just maybe, there is something else out there. Wow. And, you know, in that moment, it struck me. Another male spirit had entered the room when Dr. Patel was working on me for those 20 minutes. And I kept on hearing the same voice over and over again say, keep working on him. Don't give up. You can save him. Keep working on him. Don't give up. You can save him. And it was like this puzzle unscrambled. And all of a sudden, it struck me. It was Dr. Patel's father speaking to her through me encouraging her to continue to keep working on me. And, you know, I didn't have the courage to tell her that that happened because I thought, hey, this woman's going to think I'm crazy. I just met this woman. So it wasn't until a year later when I went back to the hospital to interview her and the other two doctors, Dr. Bajwa, who was the cardiologist, and Dr. Carson, who was the one that intubated me. I went back to the hospital and interviewed them for my book. And that's when I told her. And, you know, it changed her life too, because now she knows that her father really has never left her. And, you know, Carol Ann, when we think about things like that, what it's taught me is, is that these things really shouldn't be a surprise to anyone because we are spiritual beings mm -hmm. first, having this human experience. And, you know, why would it be so surprising that, you know, someone's spirit would come to you, particularly some a loved one that was that close to you in, in time of need? So that was um, the first part of my experience. That's incredible. Like I said to you earlier when we were talking, um, I've heard so many NDE stories and yours just got to my heart somehow. I, I can't quite explain it, but it just like, you know, when you feel the presence of the Holy ghost and you get the chills, uh, it's kind of like that. And I, I yeah. think it especially moved me because just a quick note, I lost my husband of 47 years, three years ago. I'm sorry. And, thank you. And I felt that like I was cheated out of, of course, yeah. the rest of my life sure, with sure. But the thing that disturbed me the most was we had a pact and we would always say, whoever passes away first, you have to give me a sign. Like, 
I don't care if you show up as a ghost, like do whatever you need to do. And that didn't happen for me. And when I hear your story and stories like yours, it kind of gives me more because I'm very Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm I'm very much a believer. So am I. Yeah, thank the Lord. And um, I just feel maybe he's in a good place so, and like a resting place and he's doing OK and he's maybe he just can't come to me. It's just not meant to be. But. It's 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 really very an emotional thing to go through. Yes. Yes. Well, and I can tell you that. Here's here's one of the things that I've learned in, in my on my journey is that our spiritual eyes are really dumbed down by everything that's going on around us in, right. in the world these days. I mean, we are so overwhelmed. We're so overwhelmed with social media, with, with you know, the world's on fire right now with all of the things that are going on in the world. We're so busy. You know, you go through a grief period. You may still be in grief. I'm sure you are to some yes. degree. But all of those things close us down when there may have been times when he was trying to, to mm -hmm. show up. You know, he, he could show up in the form, which is very common, show up in the form of an animal show mm -hmm. up in, in the form of, um, I've talked to many people, credible people that have had NDEs that, you know, show up in the form of um, this one guy that I talked to who had an incredible experience, was very close to his dad. They had this thing about, uh, he was always losing his wallet, this guy. And he told me many times how, you know, he would lose his wallet and somehow it would show up and it would show up with, with things reshuffled in them. Um, wow. You know, like in the, in the house, not like, yeah, he lost yeah. it, you know, so, you know, there, there are spirit does communicate with us in, in, right. and there are, in, there are some instances where for whatever reason, and no one knows these mysteries and those are the mysteries of faith that we don't get any kind of, communication. I was right. very close to my mother. My father died in uh, a steel mill accident when I was five. Oh. And uh, my my mother and I were very, very close. And it was years later that my mother finally came to me in a uh, kind of like, you know, in an awakened dream. But, you know, holding my daughter Maria while she was having seizures, I used to get very angry. I used to, you know, cry out at my mother and say, hey, you know, you're you're in the spiritual realm now. Why can't why can't you help us? You know, so I understand your frustration. Yeah. You now, and in your book, you 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 detail so much, and and this is just the beginning of your story. It it's it's so impactful. The, what what else happened to you? So I I don't want folks to think that that was like the whole yeah. experience. It was it was not. It was just a small part of it. Yeah. I highly recommend people read your book. It's just, once you start reading it, you just can't stop. Like, I, that's what happened to me. I just sat here and was riveted. I, I couldn't just stop reading. Uh, let's talk about, you mentioned the orb in the very early stages of your book, this orb that you saw. I think you were five in your crib, you said, right? Yes, yes. Let's talk about that for a minute because that to me... I, I found that very curious hmm. that you would remember that too in such great detail. Maybe you can just go go through that a little bit and explain what I'm talking about. Sure. And I think, you know, that's something that I'm rarely asked, but yet when someone reads the whole book, all of that comes, and I'm not going to spoil anything for anyone who wants to read the book, but it all comes full circle in the end, as you know. So you know, that orb came to me and and to go back, because this isn't even in the book. When my father was injured in the mill, he had been knocked off of a platform and fell on his back on a hot steel billet and his kidneys were crushed. Back then, there was no dialysis. So he was sick for years and years and years. So my mother went to the doctor and said, hey, my, my, my husband is so depressed. What can I do to help him? And, and he said, look, I've never known anyone to love children as much as your husband. You need to have another child. It'll it'll break him out of his depression. So I was kind of born as a, a toy, you know, to bring my father joy and, 
and help him out of this depression. So what happened was, is that in, in there are times when I wake up now and, and think, what, what, what is the meaning? Cause this had multiple meanings to me throughout my life, but before he died. So we were in a very small two bedroom house. I have three older brothers and my crib was in my parents' house. And um, at the time, you know, my parents were speaking Italian, which, you know, I didn't understand. And I was lying in my crib one night. And I don't know if this was a sign from the Holy Spirit to give me strength to hold on because my father was getting ready to pass. And I've, many times I've thought about that. But there I was lying on my back uh, with my hands to my side, my favorite sleeping position. And here comes this, this white, glowing, pulsating orb that came down. I saw it starting to seep through the ceiling and it started to, to, to just flow back and forth very, very slowly. And then as it approached me, it actually turned into a hand and it just came into my, into my right hand. And when it did, it was almost as if this light was like electricity. It just, I jumped up out of the crib and I grabbed onto the rails of the crib and I was laughing uncontrollably like only a child can do, you know, with no preoccupation of the world or its problems. And I remember my parents saying something in Italian and then, you know, going back to sleep. But that glowing orb, which I know now is the Holy Spirit, is something that I held on to my entire life when I was going through my own issues of being, you know, without a father, being bullied because I didn't have a father. And it was being raised in a in a rough and tumble steel town is a is a different yeah. experience, you know. But it has a lot it has a lot more deeper meaning than than just that. I mean, that's enough in itself. But in my second near-death experience, when I finally came out of that and began to write, I realized it, it had a much, much deeper meaning for everyone, not just me. Yeah, I found that amazing that you can recall that in, in such great detail too. I was trying to think back when I was five, like if I had any memories, I think I just had one maybe possibly. So that was pretty amazing. But let's let's move on a little bit. And like I said before, that was just the beginning really of your journey. Mm -hmm. Um where would you like to move on next to? Because a lot happens, but um, obviously you, you've had a donor heart. Um, you look phenomenal, by the way. God bless. Oh, thank you. You look so healthy. Thank God. Yeah. I, I want to just get to that. Maybe you can like fast forward us a little bit. Sure. So folks can understand some of the rest of your story and, and how incredible it is. You know, I, I know it's it's a lot, but let's just see if we can get to where you, they discovered you needed this donor heart. Sure. Well, I'll give you a, a quick thumbnail sketch of that, and we'll fast forward to um, my second near-death experience and how all this came to be. So, of course, you know, before I was released from the hospital, it, they told me my heart was completely destroyed. And the only way that I could live it was with a heart transplant. So... Before I left, they did two things. I had a defibrillator vest put on me. It looks like a policeman's vest. And this battery pack strapped on my, my right shoulder. So every time my heart would go go out, it would shock me back back to life. Talk about you know PTSD, right? So Because it would, would go out often. So that was um, just a couple of weeks. And then I started to get weaker and weaker and they knew that wasn't enough. So I went back to the hospital and they put a port in my chest. And this port was dripping medicine on my heart called milrinone, which my doctor said, just think of it as like STP for the car. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna let that heart pump a lot better. But problem is, is that it wears the heart out faster. So the clock was really starting to tick now. So I had another battery pack on my left shoulder with this bag of medicine and every 60 seconds, you know, you'd hear this burr, you know, which squirt this medicine. So I'm getting shocked. I got this med this thing squirting medicine. Up my heart. So I look like this, you know, creature from uh, some sci-fi movie walking around. 
And I, I couldn't get a heart anywhere. I went to all of the transplant centers here. I sent my records everywhere. And it was kind of like a Hollywood story. At the last minute, I called my boss in Chicago. I worked for a privately held steel company. And I said, look, I'm resigning. I can't get a heart. I'm just going to you know, fade off into the sunset here. Thanks for everything. And my boss said, well, before you do that, let me talk to the owner of the company. So the owner of the company, I didn't know heart disease ran in his family. He's a big philanthropist uh, to the University of Chicago Medicine. And he helped me get admitted to the University of Chicago Medicine. So finally, after three months, I finally got admitted to the University of Chicago Medicine to be evaluated for heart transplant. Now there's a lot of things that you have to go through and that can prevent you from getting a heart transplant. And of course the list is even to this day, very, very, very long, only a small percentage of people that need a heart get one. So what happened was, is that it was almost six months had gone by. They found another issue in me that I didn't even know that I had that disqualified me from getting a heart. So there I was, I weigh about 174 pounds. I had atrophy down to like 132 pounds. I was just this yellow green skeleton with a child's voice, unrecognizable. And when my doctor came in, who I had a very good relationship with, and he said, Rob, I'm sorry, we found this in you. The government won't let us give you a heart. So I had called my wife and I told her what happened. And Carol Ann, this is really uh, an incredible example of the power of negativity. So it was, an, it was amazing because all that happened and there I was alone in Chicago. I was on the eighth floor of the hospital uh, looking out over Lake Michigan. And you know, Lake Michigan's like an ocean, just incredible how big it is. So there I was and that night, there was this incredible storm like I'd never seen before in my life that just whipped up out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, I'm in this room alone and this the lightning and the rain was like something I'd never seen. And these sheets of rain pounding against my window. And as you can imagine, I started to go down this path of negative thinking. And it was really ugly. Things like, you know, you have no value. You never found your purpose. You've never made anything of your life. Now you're going to die. Here you are. And every mistake that I'd ever made in my life, things that I've been ashamed of, there are times when I prayed for my daughter to die because I was tired of seeing her suffer. Very, very personal, deep things that um, had come up. And it was almost as if you could call him Satan call it whatever you want, but there was this dark entity in the room. It was just baiting me, reminding me of all these things and to weaken my spirit. And it was working. And it was in that moment that I, I guess I just worked myself up into an anxiety attack. And my heart just started pounding out of my chest. I was sweating profusely. And then my heart went into tachycardia. And I can hear the alarm on the bed go off. And that's when I cried out. And I just said, do with me what you will, tired of fighting. And it was in that moment that I was taken up into a place that I call in the book, the ethereal. Because it was kind of like this in-between place. And it kind of looks like your screen back there, your background screen. And I remember there I was in this moment and... I found myself standing in the middle of nowhere and I could see myself down in my green hospital gown in my bed dying with all these machines hooked up to me. But at the same time, I could see myself standing in the middle of nowhere with the same green hospital gown on healthy. And I thought, how is this, how is this possible? What, what can be going on here? And I was on, I wasn't on any drugs that could give me a hallucination or anything. And I remember thinking, standing there in the middle of nowhere, hey, if this is, you know, heaven or whatever this place is, how come my parents aren't coming to greet me? You know, I didn't see, I remember being very disappointed standing there. I didn't see Jesus Christ. There were no angels. I didn't hear any music. It was just me standing in the middle of nowhere. 
But then it almost is clear as I'm talking to you, but their communication, by the way, wasn't something that you could hear. It was more of, it was like telepathy and synchronicity at the same time. And all of a sudden, these things began to be impressed on my spirit. I could hear as clear as I'm talking to you. This is the foundation for everything. This is the divine source. My power is omnipotent. This is your real identity. And in that moment, I knew that I was in the presence or of God, of a divine intelligence. And then I felt like all of a sudden that I was connected to the vast wisdom of the universe, all of it without words. It was almost as if the, the, the grains of my being were made of sand. Somebody just picked me up and scattered me across this infinite timeless universe. And in that moment, I knew that I was not my body, my race, or my religion. And if I wanted to know the answer to any question, all I had to do was think about it. And I remember thinking, what, what an incredible, beautiful, peaceful experience this is. Just standing there, connected to the infinite wisdom of God, and not to be afraid of anything. And it was in that moment that I saw and became part of this beautiful web made of twinkling lights that were all woven together. And we all remember what uh, a neuron looks like from science class. It has a nucleus and it has tentacles and dendrites and they weave together. And it was shown to me that inside each one of those little nucleuses was this spark or quark of light. And it was shown to me that these quarks, and some physicists call them photons, these quarks combine, because there are several of them, they combine to create infinite possibilities in the universe. They can become a tree, a person, a dog, a planet, a solar system, a brain, it doesn't matter. And each one of those little nucleuses represented the life of a human being. And there I was connected to everything. And this tapestry of lights just seemed to extend into infinity and hang on the ceiling of the universe. And I became part of that tapestry. And that's when I realized that that glowing orb that I saw in my crib, there it was. I was just one little speck in trillions and trillions and trillions of little glowing orbs. That's who we are. And it was shown to me that God uses light to create, heal, and transform us. It's the same recipe. We're all connected. We're all made of the same stuff, whether it's matter of, of animate or inanimate substance. It's all the same. We just manifest differently. And when I was there connected to everything, I thought, if I hurt myself, I hurt everything connected to me. But if I love the light will spread. And in that moment, when I had that realization, there it was. I had the most profound experience that has changed my life forever. There was my daughter, Maria. There she was, standing there. She came out of that web. And in this temporal world, Maria cannot walk, talk, or feed herself. But there, she came out of the web perfect and whole, and she was standing there. And she had this light coming through her eyes, emanating through her eyes. And it wasn't the kind of light that we see in the natural world. It was the spiritual light that animates all life. That's the spirit. Without it, we're just flesh and blood, and you know, we just don't exist. And for the first time, in 20 years, we had a conversation in that unspoken language of the ethereal. And I looked at her and I said, Maria, I said, I've never heard your voice. I've never heard you say, I love you, daddy. We've never had a conversation. Your mother and I, we've taken you everywhere to try to find a cure. We've given up everything. I said, just tell me, tell me what it is that I could do for you. 
And she said three words that have transformed my life. She said, just love me. And you know, when she said, just love me, I had just, I cried out into that inf infinite space. And I said, I never want to leave this place. I heard my own voice echo back to me. And that's when I found myself back in my hospital bed. Absolutely amazing. Um, did you pass away again at that moment? Do you think when you went into tachycardia that you went into this ethereal place? Do you think that's what, did they come and code you again or? They came in and put injected something into my IV bag, which got the heart back into its right. normal, back into its normal rhythm. And I remember lying there thinking, I don't care if I ever get a heart. I just want to be back there. I want to be, I want to be back there where I'm connected to everything, where I could see my daughter whole and perfect. So at that moment, I I didn't care, but I did because I was also told to testify. And I remember thinking, huh, well, if that's the case, I know the perfect heart is going to show up. And it was shortly after that that my transplant team got, came back in and told me, hey, we want an exception from the government. We're going to put you back on the transplant list. And shortly afterward, I was transplanted. And I, I, I don't want to get into the identity of my donor, um, but I can tell you that this person was meant to live inside me. You go into detail about that in your in your book. That I do, yeah, I do. I go into great detail um, about this whole heart brain connection, right. why heart transplantation works, how that person's um, not necessarily memories but essence is passed on through, you know, your taste in foods change, your right. your a lot of things change, and that that. That heart has a brain. It's not just a muscle because it's one of the first things that form in a mother womb. So this, this conversation with the heart and the brain start very early um, in one's life in the mother. And so it's natural to, you know, to, to believe. And it's only, only been recently that scientists have found the actual brain inside the human heart that makes all of this work and heart transplantation work. Because when you take a, a birth heart out of someone and you put someone else's in there, that heart has to figure out a way to communicate with the brain because it controls our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, hormone production, a neurological system, all of these things. And of course, the most fascinating one, which I love, is the electromagnetic pulses that come out from the heart that actually connect us to everyone like the web in this physical world. It's all about the heart. That's why- It makes every... so much sense. It really does, because everything is vibration, really, so. There you go. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter what religious text you read besides the Bible, it's all about the heart. And there's a reason for it, you know? But you uncovered some things about your donor. Mm. They're mind-blowing. And that kind of opened up a whole world to you as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. A lot of so-called, uh, I've coined the phrase in my book that coincidences are God's way of remaining anonymous. Yeah. Because so there were just too many coincidences. Yes. Um, oh, so many. With the donor, with the donor and uh, and my mom and, and some other things that were just right. mind, mind, mind blowing. Yeah. Now, since then, I mean, obviously you healed up beautifully, you recovered. Have you been connected? Do you still? Well, that's a silly question. Obviously, you're still connected to, to the God source. But in a special way, do you feel even more connected since you were able to experience that web of life source that connects us all? Do you still... Oh. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, what it what it's done is anchored my life because 
I still, I, I lead a very busy life. I travel uh, a lot in my job and my daughter Maria is like a hurricane. You know, when you enter her path, I mean, it's, she's all consuming um, because she's total care and she's 28 now. So, you know, it's, it's an anchor to remind me of what is really important and what we're all gonna end up doing. As you know, from personal experience, unfortunately, we all leave this body eventually, Right. but there's nothing to fear because it's there where our real life begins, in my opinion, because, you know, this web that I saw, I've come to understand in my life that it's, it's a reflection of what happens here. And that's why it's important for us all to find purpose and to understand that we're all connected and that we're all one. And if we could ever really grasp that concept, there would be nothing to fight about. You know, so this web of light and dark, and when I was in there connected to this web, I saw some areas that weren't as bright as others. Mm. And I had wondered what that was. I thought to myself, is that evil? But I came to understand that it, it was where people were not allowing this divine love and light of the creator to come through them. You see, that is the secret to life. God both experiences and expresses life through us. That's the gift. And when we realize that that's the gift, it enriches our life in such a way that our, our light gets brighter and it lights the path and emboldens others, just others, like I saw yeah. in the web. And that's how we light up the world, Caroline. Gosh, that's so true. I am just blown away by, by the things that you're you're saying. It's just moving me even closer to my, my commitment to Jesus. But um, it's interesting if you listen to other people that have had NDE, some of them clearly see Jesus. Yeah. We'll talk about this person or entity in a white robe with angelic beings around them and, and other people like yourself, like every NDE is seems so different and unique. What do you think accounts for that? Well, I think that the Lord chooses to give people the information that they can best express. You know, I think that if I was disappointed that I did not see Jesus Christ, I was disappointed that I didn't see my parents and um, and friends and grandmother and all of that. But yet God expressed to me in concepts that I could understand and communicate best. It took me three years to write my book. And every morning I would get up at 4.30 in the morning because I had to go to work at 7.30 and I found out that that, you know what, in the Bible, they call that the fourth watch. The fourth mm -hmm. watch is when when Jesus came, when these guys, when the disciples were in the boat and it was sinking and they were giving up hope, it was in the fourth watch. It was probably like 4.30 in the morning. And that's when Christ came across the water and, and, and reached out. And there's a magical thing that happens in that window. And for me, that's when I wrote, and I would pray to the Holy Spirit to allow the words to express through me and not from me. Mm. And there were many, many a morning, <laughs> ask my wife, she'd come knocking on the door and there's paper thrown all over the place and I was frustrated and nothing would come. But in other days it would come so fast I'd have to, I'd have to use my tape recorder. Mm. So, you know, it, it takes work to connect with, the Holy Spirit um, and patience, you know? So I think that, again, that's why some people are shown, I'm jealous. Some people got to see Jesus with, right. you know, with, with angels. And, but instead I was shown concepts. Um, that's the only way I could answer it. That concept in and of itself makes so much sense. Like, because as you're explaining it, I'm visualizing it and it just, yeah. It just hits home. It makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. See, and I'm sure that I was given that because, uh, you know, I would be able to express it better than, right. 
you know, being stunned by seeing Jesus and uh, right. what, else, what else is there to talk about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. So um, where are you now? Like health wise, what are your plans moving forward? Clearly you went back to work, right? Like tell us where you're at right now and what's happening in your life. Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate you being interested. Yes. I'm so I'm eight years out from transplant. I've never once had an infection or a rejection. Um, this person just loves living here and, and, and I love it and expresses through me at times that continue to surprise me. Um, so, and it was one of the driving forces of, of writing the book, you, you know, even my doctors, my, uh, my pastor, a lot of people encouraged me to write it, uh, but so did this person. But, you know, Carolyn, I'm in a place where uh, I'm going to be 65 in September, and I've got to work a few more years because of Maria's needs financially. She has a lot of needs, and that's okay. But before I leave, I've got another book in me, I, I, and I want to write about the light of God and how different people see it around the world and what it is that they call it, you know, the the native the native indians called it something different than we did and um the jewish faith calls it something different and there are other indigenous people call it something that they all know what it is but but they i mean they know that feeling that light they know what it is to to feel something different but but a lot of people don't know what to call it you know and i i try to i want to kind of get in between those cracks and open things up a little bit um, because I'm all about unity. So I, uh, I continue to, you know, journal and think about this book that I would like to finish before I leave this earth and, you know, continue to do the best I can for Maria and others. I've become so much of an empath since all of this has happened. Have you? you know, I could feel people's pain and I just try to help where I can, you know. So this, uh, it's a very enriching part of, of my life. It's uh, it's something that, you know, like I said, at 56 years old, I dropped dead and who would have thunk it? You know, I had other plans. <laughs> I, I think that your new book sounds very timely too, because as you see what we're going through globally, um, yeah. it's, it's a mess. But at the same time, there's so many people that are rebaptizing and coming to Christ. And that's right. There's an awakening that's happening on the planet. That's absolutely beautiful. Mm. So I, I think that, boy, I can't wait for you to write that book. We're going to have to meet up again when you do. Well, that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be I awesome. love your story. It's so, I'm not often left speechless because I love to talk, but <laughs> I, you know, when I finished reading your book, it, I, I literally sat here for a few minutes and, and just had cried because it was so moving in so many ways. And I, I highly recommend folks read it. I think it's a game changer for the way that you think about things and you think about every day. Um, it, it, you wake up differently after yeah. reading it. You just do. It, it, I did. It's just your whole story is, is incredible and it's a miracle and I'm so honored to cross paths with you. Oh, well, thank you so much. It has been a wonderful conversation. I've enjoyed it so much. And uh, hopefully we can get together again in the future. I would love that. I, I really would. I, I would love to have a part two. Because like I said, in your book, there's so much more that we could talk about. So when you're free, I would love to connect again and do this again. Sure. Well, we'll... Well, we'll put that on that. We'll put that on the calendar down the road, and we'd love to love to come back and speak with you. Awesome! Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me.